Now, we are very welcome, we're very pleased to welcome here some students. And this session is presented by WebWise, the Irish Better Internet Center, uh, the Safer Internet Day Ambassador Program. And we have four uh, ambassadors here with us. And this session is facilitated by Anthony Kilcoyne from the Professional Development Service for Teachers, the Technological in Education team. And Anthony will introduce our four students to you. Thank you very much. You're supposed to ask who is the student, who are the students <laughs> amongst the panel, and do a straw poll. We've moved past that. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, delighted to be here with you for a very short conversation with our students. Um, we've heard so much over the last two days about students, about our learners, about our learners' data, about schools' use of data. It's very fitting and very important that we actually have the students represented here during the conference, just to give some insight into their awareness of the use of data and maybe some of the use of data in learning. So as, as the introduction, went through the introduction, I'm Angela Coyne, I, I'm Deputy Director, uh, working with the WebWise team uh, in PDST, it's a teacher support service. There are several teacher support services, all funded by the Department of Education, and we work specifically to support schools in embedding digital learning, digital technologies, I should say, in teaching, learning, and assessment. So before I get the guys to introduce themselves, I want to just thank colleague, my colleague Susan Mulhall in the Department of Education for organizing our wonderful panel here this morning. And of course, our colleague, Rena Hayden, um, who is the National Participation Office Manager uh, in Core Linnog for reaching out to the network. Uh, the guys here represent four of the Coordinators here in Ireland, uh, Dublin-based, Monaghan-based, I think it's Wicklow-based, so all on the East Coast. And we're delighted to have them here uh, to, give, to give their voice to the conference. So just to my left we have, Hi everyone, um, my name is Anna. I'm from County Leash, but I'm currently studying in college in St. Patrick's College, Carlow. And I'm in my first year there. And I've had a little bit of experience with uh, digital literacy and a few kind of workshops and stuff over the year in secondary school. And yeah, I'm really delighted to get to be here to have a bit good discussion today. Lovely Anna, thank you very much. And we have then. Hi everyone, my name is Madis Babraskis. I'm a fifth year student in St. McCarran's College in Monaghan and I'm 17 years old. Thanks, Madis. Um, I'm Kate and I'm 15 and I'm from Wicklow and I'm in St. David's in Wicklow. What year are you in, Kate? Oh, I'm in third year. Third year <laughs> student, so the junior, lower secondary end. Thank you. Emma? Um, hi, I'm Emma. Um, I'm from Dublin. I'm a fifth year student and I'm really excited to be here today. Great. Can we get a, a, a warm round of applause <laughs> for our students? That's great. Thank you very much. And I suppose over the two days, we've talked a lot about a datafied society and the, 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 the need to have um, data literate citizens in what's become a very complex and interconnected kind of ecosystem. And I suppose what we want to start is kind of your, your general awareness of data and data uses and, and how data, what data is collected on learning in your experience in schools, and we have also the, the tertiary sector represented here in terms of third level. So do you wanna talk a little bit about the data that's collected? Yeah, so more, more often than not, the usual data collected by, from students is kind of data around your attendance, your results, and your behavior, and stuff like that in school. You're not really, students are not really as aware of what's going to be collected by what they're using through emails, school emails, and things like that. It's rather their parents that get all the information about what's going on. But definitely through the years, and especially in TY, I was involved in the Web Boys program, and I was able to like talk to first years about the control of data and how it is important to kind of be aware of what you're sending it to other people and where you're getting it from. But in schools in general, we do like IT programs, so we do computer studies in first year, and then we do we do go on to further develop that in transition year and we get a certificate from Microsoft Word in the end. But it is kind of, there is definitely needs to be more awareness of like what students are getting recorded on for by their emails or by their schools on a daily basis. Super, thanks for that. And, and what's your experience? Uh, so my school is the f was the first school in Ireland to get the Google sc uh, reference school status. 
So we use a lot of the Google products, G Suite for Education, Classroom, Docs, Drive, all that. And we use the assignment feature a lot, where the teacher puts up an assignment and then we f submit it and then they can give us like a private f like feedback or a score. And particularly in third year, due to COVID when the junior cert was canceled, a lot of those assignments were used to calculate a predicted grade for us instead of us doing the traditional exam. Excellent, excellent. And we, we'll come back to some of that conversation around the whole COVID experience and the, the school closure period and what we've learned from that and maybe the data use during that period. Your own experience? Well, I think to build off Anna's point, a lot of information is and a lot of data is collected on us when we go to school, but because we're minors, like our parents or our guardians, opt in for us and there's no opting out of it. So the school takes a lot of information on us and I don't think it's always like very clear in school where that information has gone because I can look through my school email, but we're not given a choice if we want a school email or not. We're given one and we have to use that for everything that we do. So it feels like a lack, sometimes a lack of choice, especially using assignments or using Zoom. We have to use our school emails as well. Okay, so that, 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 that learner voice, maybe the, lear the learner choice in the whole piece. And Emma, your own experience? Um, for me anyway, I know like when I was like just started secondary school, um, a lot of the information that was recorded about us wasn't necessarily for us, um, it was for our parents, which I guess kind of makes sense, but like in recent years, especially with COVID and everything, um, we've become a lot more dependent on um, different softwares and we've, and they're actually been beneficial for us, not just our parents, like with Microsoft Teams, my school has become very dependent on that. Um, which I think is a great way because it's not our parents that are in the school, it's us. So we should be able to um, see our academics recorded and be able to see how they're ref how we can improve them ourselves. Um, yeah. Excellent, excellent. And so we, has, we started off with the conversation there around behavioral data, attendance data, and so on. We started to kind of mine in a little bit closer towards the, the learning piece. And that's where I want to bring the conversation now in terms of of you, so you started there, Emma, actually, in terms of how that data might affect the learning experience. Have you any thoughts on, 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 on or anyone any thoughts on how, how this data could impact, maybe positively, on the learning experience otherwise? I think um, when this data is collected, it can really benefit students um, because it can potentially update these outdated systems. Like, I know the Leaving Cert, there's a lot of talk about how it's way too much pressure on anyone and how it's been in works for ages for it to be um, changed. Um, we saw with the, I don't know what year, maybe it was the first year of COVID where they had um, continuous assessments instead of the actual leaving cert. And a lot of people found that more beneficial. Um, but now we've kind of gone backwards because they've brought in the traditional leaving cert again. Um, so I think that by using this data, being able to see how students work can be very accommodating to more students because some people have like hidden disabilities or maybe they they don't work the sorry and th maybe they don't work that best in an actual like school environment and no one really needs knows why and um, so I think when collecting all this data on these students it can really accommodate a lot more students and can make them perform to the best of their abilities. Thanks, Emma. And, and Emma referenced there the, that notion of continuous assessment. You've also started to bring us into that kind of area of personalization and, and, and the needs of learners. Emma, can I stick with you? Can you talk a little bit about how you, you spoke about the, the continuous assessment earlier. You spoke about the different, state, different actors having, having access to the teacher, the learner, the parent. Can you talk about how the continuous assessment cycle worked well for the learner? Um, because like I said, the Leaving Cert is a lot of pressure on a lot of students. So with the continuous assessment, you're able to see how well the student does just in general, because in my opinion anyway, a big exam at the end of the year doesn't determine your academic ability. Um, so students being able to be recorded on all these projects that they can work on throughout the year, to me, makes a lot more sense um, than some final exam at the end of the year where all it is is cramming information in, which doesn't amount to anything. Does anyone else want to come in there in terms of the, the learner and, and the assessment data that Emma is talking about there and your experience of that? 
Um, well, I think for me, just using data would help bring about like more equity in education and it would help people who don't uh, fit well into the traditional classroom environment and it would help them to like gain a more or a better academic journey than the traditional one. And I do think that it would help greatly because, yeah. <laughs> yeah so we've kind of touched there re really well there on the area of equity. Touch, Emma touched on the area of, of needs. Does anyone want to elaborate a little bit on, on how, you, how you narrow that equity divide or how maybe it's supporting different needs? At least in our school, if somebody needs like a little bit of extra support, they have, we have a wide range of resources. We have laptops, we have tablets. If it's like just looking at sites and writing down notes isn't as beneficial for them, it's like there's different ways of learning digitally than just yeah. pen and paper. Okay, and I'm, I'm thinking towards even going back to the continuous assessment piece in terms of the, the what you see so as, a, as a student. In terms of that continuous assessment piece, you, you just kind of said, Emma, you think it's better, in your, in your opinion, than the, that kind of end, end piece, so much of assessment space. What does the learner see in terms of their data in that kind of assessment conversation with their with their teacher? Are they, are they seeing, are they seeing a, re a result, an outcome, or are they seeing something more or different? Well, I think, because I've been in secondary school, but I've never taken a full state exam. So I don't, I've never seen a continuous assessment, but back in primary school, it was continuous assessment. And instead of, at the end of the year, you would do big exams, you did smaller tests every week and you're, you would amount to a grade at the end of the year. And I do think that worked even for a smaller child because they probably would even get stressed out. And there would also be uh, pressure from their parents to do well, but instead it was, you would do a test every week. And I do think that if they took, if they went, if they took like what primary schools do into secondary schools, it would help because it would take the pressure and the stress off because I know when you're doing exams in school, it's really, really stressful. And then once it's done, it's over. And you feel a bit like empty, like you don't know what you're meant to do. And then the pressure's back on for your next set of exams. So by using data, you could put it into smaller tests instead. And, and, think, and looking back on your, your primary experience, do you, do you think you, you yourself learned from doing those continuous assessments? How did you learn? Did you, did you act on the assessment? Yeah, like I do think that I did, and I think it probably encouraged me more to do, just keep on expanding on my learning instead of um, having a summer break and then having to go back and do it all again. I do think that it helped. And maybe keeping the conversation in that kind of ongoing assessment space in terms of platforms you've engaged with at school. You can talk a little bit about the, the, the assessment, um, the formative assessment, the assessment space on those platforms and your engagement with them in terms of the work you're doing now? Um, in college at the moment, the platform we use is Moodle. So it kind of every day they put the lecturers get to post up their notes, their assignments, or the details of the, what the lecture is going to entail. And then you can go back in and you can see all your timetables and your assessment timetables. And like you can go into your, like your modules and see how you're performing in certain assignments and when your next assignment test is. And it's crucial because they can also give you the feedback and they, you can see how well you're doing on a certain assignment and where you're, there's definitely room for improvement. And then in secondary school, we used a lot of Google Classroom. So there was, you can go back in and you can see what exactly you submitted and you, the teacher can still feed back to you through your emails. And it's just, it's a way you can both the teacher and the student keep it on track and be able to see what they're using and how they're improving throughout the year. Excellent. Anyone else have a, have a, a similar experience? Or you mentioned Google School earlier on in terms of the assessment space in, in Google Classroom. Can you talk us through that a little bit? Yeah, so for us, like if we are given an assignment, it's put up on Google Classroom and uh, we just like, if it's on paper, we take a photo of it. If it's digital, we like attach the file, submit it, and then the teachers can give us feedback, correct it. Uh, see what's wrong with it, see what's good about it, give us like tips and feedback on how we can continue learning and what needs more work. And do you think it supports not just your, the class as a group, their needs, 
Do you think it supports your individual needs in any yeah. way? Yeah, because coming up to tests or exams, I can look at my Google Classroom and I can see, oh, this topic I need more work in, this topic I'm all right for. So it lets me manage my time more effectively and lets me see what needs more work and what I'm okay at. Okay, very interesting. Do you want to chime in on that a little bit about the assessment piece? Yeah, well, I think we use Google Classroom, but we use it a lot more during online schooling, and I feel that the school have gradually phased it out, and we've gone back to more traditional schooling. I think we've taken steps back in the way that I don't, we don't do quizzes online, we do them through paper, and they only, they barely post anything on our Google Classroom, so I can't really add to the assessment be online because it's all done through paper and it's done through traditional schooling in my school so i can't really s like say anything That's absolutely about fine yeah. and, and we brought us into that piece of, of i suppose the the whole school closure period here in ireland and many of our colleagues all our colleagues experienced something similar um and that change can you talk to us a little bit about of, of going through that maybe yourself if you don't mind going through that experience of of you call it online schooling, okay, so we kind of, kind of call it emergency remote teaching and learning. What was that experience like for you in that, in that transition? So I was in transition year when the whole online learnings uh, began, when we were sent home for COVID. And it was very difficult in TY to keep up with the work and to be motivated enough to be posting all these assignments. And because TY was all about fun and trips and doing different events and things. So it was very hard to go back to doing schoolwork and trying to post up maths homework, etc. And then I went into fifth year when the second lockdown kicked in and there was a lot more engagement with the teachers and students because there was obviously more focus on our education because we had the Leaving Cert at the end of it. And they were definitely really focused on how they were getting the information to us and how we were able to use different sites and different means of learning to keep us all motivated and to keep a different like idea around how we're supposed to learn for geography or for history and it was a very interesting period to go through. Okay and then you guys were in lower secondary at the time, what was the experience like for you guys? It was very sudden because one day we were in school just doing pen and paper and, and then the next day we're at home and at least for our school, the timetable ran pretty much as normal. So you'd go to all your classes just during video call. And at the end of the class, the teacher would put up the notes. Um, some of them had like the visualizers where they had like a camera of their sheet and we can see what they're doing and we can follow along. And then they also use a lot of different software. I know in maths, we use Khan Academy to explain topics more in depth and stuff like Autograph for graphing exercises. So I think it was all very organized and we could still see what we were doing and how we were doing and what needs to be due and all that. So I think it was pretty, a pretty good experience. Okay. Anyone else want to come in on that in terms of that, ch that sudden change and a different way of working and the, the amount of data now being collected perhaps? Well, I was actually, I was in my last year of primary school when we had the first lockdown so it was very strange for me because uh, primary school is a lot of interaction with your peers and it's a lot of group work and then when you're at home it's harder because the teachers didn't really know they didn't have access to a lot of resources that we could do engaging things so it it almost felt like what secondary school felt like when I started because it was you would go through your they would give you a list of work for the week and you would work your way through it. And we did use online resources, but it felt very um, rigid in its structure and it didn't feel like what primary school was meant to feel like. And in the second lockdown, I was in first year, which was really, it was strange for me because I was just getting to know new people. And then we go online and we start learning online for two months, which was really, it was, tough on the social aspect of school because I wasn't able to see any of the like new friends that I had. And um, we did a lot of um, assignments online. A lot of our classes were through Zoom. Some teachers had pre-recorded and there was, I felt there was a lot more work that was given to us. Like there was a lot of homework that would be given to us to try and keep us, keep up with the course and keep up with the curriculum, even though we were at home. So it's very interesting there that we, we start to reach out into that relation that relationship piece that was discussed in the previous 
panel and, and that relationship between learner and teacher and, and the data within that conversation space. We've kind of focused really on the institutional context piece there of the school. Um, briefly, I'm going to reach out of that into your, in, your own personal awareness of data for use, if, that, if that's okay, before we come back to the school again in a minute. Are you, how aware are you of, of, your, of, of how your data is being used or what data you are sharing, would you say? So a lot of our personal data is being shared to companies such as name, age, your search history to like personalize ads and stuff. But a good thing is that with GDPR, you can opt out and your data is safe and secure. There's no like worry about it being used for malicious intent. And you can also download your data and see what has been tracked, uh, delete it. So I think it, you have a lot more control of your data than you used to before. So Matt, Matt certainly sounds very confident in, in, in the understanding around, around data and data sharing. How about you guys? What's your understanding of your, your how, how data is shared, what data you're sharing, how it's been used? Um, mine is very similar to what Matt said. Um, I know a lot of like my search history or um, obviously, yeah, stuff I look at online is being sold to like compa or companies to um, you know promote their stuff. Um, but I feel like a lot of it is very like when someone like would pull up like a sheet of all the information about myself that is being sold to these companies, at first you'd be like, that's really weird. Why do they know all that about me? But then you look and it's like really normal. Like it's, it's kind of strange to me, but then again, like it's just so normalized in our um, world that is so um, focused on the internet. Um, but yeah, that's my thing. I ask Emma there, so you kind of in the in the one sentence move from kind of weird to it's been normal and normalized. Is is there, is there kind of an expectation? You just expect that to happen, is it or? Yeah, like in the back of my mind, like I know this information about me is going to whoever, but like I guess sometimes we don't realize what they're exactly seeing. Does that make sense? And the two of you guys have spoken so well there around the the kind of your understanding of data use and data sharing. Do you mind me asking, how, how did you become so competent in that? Did, is it something you learned through school? Is it something you learned outside of school? Is it with peers? Or, or where did you learn all this? Mattis? Uh, so we are taught about it briefly in school, like in ICT class, and just gone over like our data and our privacy. We also have a lot of friends that are into programming, and we have computer science now as a youngster subject. I don't do it while all my friends do it, sort of shared there. What they learned with me, just in casual conversation, sort of just stuck with me. How about you, Emma? Um, Where did you build up this bank of, of knowledge from? I mean, I did business for the junior cert, so that taught us a lot about all of the data that was being sold about us. And um, then in politics class this year, we looked a lot at um, data analysis. Okay, very interesting. We're starting to see, I suppose, uh, the, the, the whole school, whole, whole curriculum support of this may be playing out here. What's your take on this? Do you mind me asking? It is very difficult to understand that everyone has their own digital footprint and things that you might look up when you're maybe a teenager will still be there and people will be able to access them when you're older and you're starting off your career. And it is good thing to have because then you can still at some points because you can see your preferences and when you're looking for things online you're able to find them faster because they know what you're looking for but then at other times when you don't really want for people to know what you're looking thinking about and what you're hoping to buy it can be a bit unnerving okay okay so moving to that kind of that pro profiling piece do you want to come in on that one um yeah so i think like my knowledge of data and data in education isn't a lot, but um, I always think that even the way that we can't opt out of our school emails, it feels like unintentionally a profile is being built on us and it might be education or it might just be in our like all aspects of life, but I feel like that we could be, the school are unintentionally like creating a profile on us. Um, I, don't, I don't really agree with that idea. And would you share that? Would you guys like to have more of a, a role in how the, your data is being used, more of a say in it? 
Yeah, I think that I, I'd like to know how it's being stored because a lot of the places that take our data, like our school management systems, there's nothing there. They don't say anything about what happens if our data is hacked and what can be done with it. And there's also, I don't think it's very clear about once you finish your like post-primary like education journey, there's nothing about the deletion of the data which worries me because it means that it would be there forever and it could just be used um, anonymously to help like machine learning algorithms, which I don't think is very ethical. That's extremely, extremely interesting. Anyone else want to come in on something on a similar line as that? That's a fantastic, deep and rich response there in terms of the potential use and, and misuse of data and, and having that say and having that voice in data usage from an early age. I just want to come in on that in terms of, would you like to see, would you, other three guys, would you like to see more of a, have more of a say in how the data is being used or collected at school or at institution level? I don't think a lot of people are aware in Ireland, like a lot of young people are aware that the digital age for kind of consent on the internet is 16. And a lot of people, like when they're younger and they're in certain primaries, like they're finishing primary school going into first year, they all tend to download apps like social media, like Snapchat and Instagram. And because the digital age is 16, a lot of them will kind of, they change their ages so that they can download these apps, so obviously to communicate with friends and stuff. But there is a downside to who else is on those apps and who else can like talk to them using social media. And there's not really a lot of like information in schools to be talked about in terms of the digital age of consent and how there these apps can be used in terms of sending inappropriate photos or scams like asking for money and things like that. So there's definitely a lot of room for improvement there. Excellent. Madis, any thoughts on that yourself? Would you like to have more of a say? Yeah, I'd say a lot more things should be opt in rather than you have to go to look and opt out then should be just opt-in by default because a lot of things, like you said, uh, you might not even be aware that they're being collected and they'll just be more, it'll just be more comfortable knowing what's being tracked, what's not being tracked. Anyone else want to come in on that? Um, I feel like a lot of it is the responsibility of the schools to be educating people on what their where their data usage goes, who can see it. Because, um, like, I only found out, like, what exactly these companies know about me because, you know, I did, I happened to pick business. But not a lot of people pick business. So, like, I feel like it needs to be a more general thing that is taught throughout schools. And most recently, which kind of annoys me, is it feels like my school is kind of taking a step back technology-wise and almost being scared of technology which is really strange considering um, from everything we've been able to do over lockdown and everything we found out with like Microsoft Teams and all these abilities we have, um, they're not doing that anymore. So it's gone back to very traditional schooling. Um, like most recently, we're getting phone pouches implemented. So we can't use them throughout the day, which I don't really agree with because they have been very handy um, education-wise. So it's very ignorant of them, I guess, to kind of ignore the elephant in the room um, because the internet is all around us and if we don't find out about it now, we're going to find out about it s how many, however many years down the road and that'll probably not be the best um, way to find out about it. So. And Emma, yesterday here we spoke of quite a bit around that balance between innovation and regulation and, and I suppose you've kind of, your example there has touched upon maybe some of that, that kind of restrictions to innovation, maybe through a uh, a, a d deliberate caution around regulation or, 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 or something from, from that kind of space of thinking. Very interesting. Um, I'm going to open up the conversation to the floor, if that's okay with you guys, in case anyone wants to join our little conversation up here with a question. We seem to have one over here. Doesn't seem to be. <laughs> okay. Hi, thank you. My name's Barbara and I'm a senior B. And uh, I was very impressed with your reflections. This was very, very interesting uh, to hear you. 
One thing I'm wondering about is none of you mentioned uh, anything about having any kind of dashboards or things like that to show progress in individual digital tools that you're using. Have you encountered that in your school? So I know at least in Google Classroom you have your feed, which is just all your classes, like tiles for them, and you go into it and there's a profile button and it just shows your name and all the assignments you've done and just like an average grade and like all the individual grades. So that's good just to see like how you're doing in that particular subject on average. So that's, that's taken after, but nothing on saying, does it tell you at the level of you don't know how to do three-dimensional geometry things or anything like that? It's more that in this class you're performing at this level? Yeah, it's more like that. It just it shows our result for an assignment. Okay. And just one other quick question, if that's allowed. <laughs> and then when you brought up this uh, interesting uh, discussion about the machine learning, um, what is your opinion if you knew that the data could be anonymized and then used by machine learning in the future to help future students? Is that something you would be able to consider? or? Not? Well, I haven't really thought about it much in depth but I just um, personally, I feel like that by not having the option to not have a school email, it doesn't, it doesn't feel fair because it's not even the situation of where your parents opt in for you. It's automatically given to you and it doesn't, there's, there's no clear data and there's no clear result of what is actually done with the data you give and I, I don't know what my school does with it and that just worries me even if it could help students. I feel like the other students should be educated on what will actually happen so that they have the choice instead of not being given the choice. Thank you very much for coming in the conversation. There were two excellent questions. We have another question from over here. You're very popular guys. Yes, um, thank you Anna, Manas, Kate and Emma. I really appreciate um, listening to you today. Um, I've been involved with my colleagues here on a study um, about um, formative, digital formative assessment in schools across Europe and as part of that study we have been talking with young people um, about their experiences um, because we are of the uh, belief and the stance that young people are equal stakeholders for us in this work. Um, and I'd like your reflections on two things that the students have really come up with that they were thought was of concern for them was that they would like whole school policies or protocols on how digital assessment or digital formative assessment is implemented. Um, so I'd like your thoughts on that. And then also, they also told us a lot about the digital poverty divide. They recognized that some of their, like some of them were well off uh, and had the devices and the internet connection and all the sort of access to resources, but they recognized that students in other schools wouldn't necessarily have that and maybe not have that in the home um, as well. So I'd welcome your thoughts on, on that too. Thank, Thank you very much. Anyone uh, like to respond from the panel to those two diff very different questions? I agree with the whole school policy because it'll set like an even ground for assessment between each different class and it'll just provide like an equal standard to which students are being assessed. So I would agree with that. And then about digital poverty, it is an issue. But I, I know personally in my local area, uh, in, the sc in schools, there's a lot of resources available. But even outside of school, we have like the local library and their laptops, computers with stable internet. So that would be a way of reducing the issue, just more access to public uh, computers and Wi-Fi. Thanks, Manus. Anyone else want to come in on that in terms of response there, that the, the, the whole school policy piece? I think it would be quite a good thing to get a digital policy and like have that in the school and make like, the parents and the students aware of like how their digital information is going to be used. But it will probably take a lot of time to get it implemented into the schools in Ireland. And it would be very important that like 
a lot of the time we're kind of overlooked as students as to what we can what we're supposed to study and how the curriculum goes and it would be you know, a very important thing to see an implementation implementation of like a digital kind of policy and so you know exactly where your information is going from your emails to the assignment you're doing be very beneficial excellent and, and in terms of that digital poverty piece Mattis Mattis kind of respond to that one anyone else like to respond to the that digital poverty piece um, well, it's really heartbreaking that there are a lot of students who would be at a disadvantage because they might not be able to afford this, that, and the other. Um, but I know in my primary school, we had iPads. Um, that was a big thing, like everyone had an iPad. It was how we did most of our schoolwork. Um, so obviously you had students who would buy their own, but the school did have a rental system. Um, and I think what worked so well was they like you all kind of had to have the same brand. Um, like you have to have the same model so that like everyone was at the same pace. Um, so I think a whole rent rental system worked really well because students had the same opportunity as other students. And I think they could also take them home as well. So it's not like they're only confined to um, these resources within the school building. Thanks, Emma. Thank you for those two lovely questions.